When it comes to research with regard to animals, certainly I think we need to go the three R's plus two. Revision, reduction, replacement, and the two other R's that go along with this are reciprocal translation and a broad responsibility. I'm not poo-pooing animal research. Research needs to be done. Nor am I poo-pooing human clinical research because research needs to be done. There are those cases, in fact, when we take a look at harms, benefits, and goods, that calculus, when in fact engaged, would dictate that yes, perhaps animals do represent a viable nexus to be able to gain this information. With respect, with responsibility, perhaps using other models, how and when capable and possible, but certainly also then affording the good of that back to the very species that we use as the model. Translate this back into veterinary medicine applications. Those things that do not make it through the multiple phases of clinical trial, for whatever reasons may in fact have engendered them to be not applicable to humans, let's re-examine that so as to ennoble and enable veterinary practice so that research does not, quote, go to waste. Certainly a broad out-of-box applications where science now informs and sustains social conduct toward each other. Applications for things such as just war, for example. Just war for just what? For whom? Why? Can neuroscience be used in those ways? Perhaps. Understand with any potential good comes the potential for harm. This then takes us to the notion of practice. And here I give you the definition of practice, paraphrased from the virtue ethicist Alistair McIntyre at University of Notre Dame. Practice is an exchange of good between individuals in relationship. It is dictated by the conduct and purpose of that relationship. How do we put this into practice? Well, certainly I think it dictates a wider and deeper considerations of notion of self and other selves. It speaks here to ethics as ecology. Echo logos, a rational approach to housekeeping, when in fact what we recognize is that house is populated by other selves, not just us. It certainly then sits this and situates it well within a movement towards things green, but is equally skeptical of a bastardization and misuse of that construct, as my colleague James Tate at the Potomac Institute is working towards. Moreover, I think what it does is it instantiates more of a communitarian construct, broadly, not only within our own species, but perhaps towards other species as well, recognizing that, in fact, our special status, because of what we know and how we know it, dictates particular sets of responsibilities of respect and action. And let's set the sights forward just for a bit. Where are we going? Where could we be going? Well, I think one of the things that happens is as neuroscience advances forward, it prompts a reevaluation of these distinctions of what we thought were natural kinds. Interestingly, one of the other informational sciences, which is genetics, how are things passed between different groups of species over time, has given us some leverage to reexamine the whole species concept. Is it a practical kind, or is it really just degrees of separation. That's not to say that species constructs are in fact erroneous, but we may need to reclassify what represents different types of things based upon different sets of categorics. Moreover, simply putting something in the category of a species does not necessarily rule out the possibility for certain types of neurological function, mentative function, and the moral regard to which we then assign it. We cannot hold our sciences in unique and pretty little silos for our own particular misuse, nor can we keep the sciences and humanities distinct. Moreover, I think what it does is it calls for reconsideration of the moral imperatives that arise, bridging what C.P. Snow referred to as the two cultures. In many ways, neuroscience, but not alone. Neuroscience together with nanoscience, genoscience, cogno and cyber science perhaps allows us to make that bridge. Moreover, I think one of the things it really calls for is a revision of certain folk concepts of mind, self, brain, 
consciousness. That's not to say that full concepts are not good things. They're very good things. Because what they allow us to do is they allow us to personalize these constructs to the masses, to de-anachronize them, to contemporize them. But the words we use are nested in antiquity. And perhaps what this calls for is a new lexicon of neuroscience. My colleague Guillermo Pachik at Georgetown University and I are working to develop just this lexicon. If I use old words, they have old meanings. If I'm looking to develop new meanings based upon new knowledge, perhaps, as Wittgenstein has said, I need to play a slightly different word game. And ultimately, it demands repurposing guidelines and policies to be able to instantiate ethics in practice. So I'm going to leave you with some points to ponder, take home messages, not only with the information that I've given you, but perhaps neuroscience writ large. There's an anonymous quote that I absolutely love, and it's been attributed to a variety of different people. I wish I said it. Skepticism is the chastity belt of science. Quite true. Then Heisenberg has come back and said, nature of science is to remain self-critical and self-revisionist, and to do otherwise is not science. Aquinas comes back and says, the goal of knowledge is not just doing what is right, but using what is right to affect the good. It sounds beautiful in Latin. Recta ratio speculabilium, recta ratio agibilium dat. Latour comes back and says, yes, absolutely. But understand that science does not bring answers many times. It prompts continued uncertainties. And we must, in fact, surf that cognitive crest and utilize the knowledge we have, not in ways that are anachronistic, not in ways that are cherry-picking and bastardized, but use what's there. Because science asks the what question. Philosophy may ponder the why and very often gives us perdurable signposts upon which to direct and steer our scientific engine. But ethics guide how. How? My father, the engineer, always used to tell me, Jim, measure twice, cut once. And perhaps these days, that's ever more important as the speed, rapidity, depth, and trajectories of science and its implications broadly within so many aspects of the social sphere, is increasing at an ardent pace. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is in fact the work of neuroethics. It takes us back to where we started. The term neuro is not simple materialistic reductionism. No, no. Neuro in each and all of the prefixes in which it is used calls forth the debate. What is brain? How does brain make mind? How does mind instantiate consciousness? What is the nature of the self? What do we know? What don't we know? And what remains unknowable? So whenever you see neuro as a prefix, neuroeconomics, neuromarketing, neurotheology, neurolaw, it's not just a frank reduction to the fact that things happen in the brain, but it begs the question of how. And certainly when we talk about neuroethics, the formal definition of any ethics are those systems of analysis of enacting moral decisions. How do we make moral decisions, and how do we guide those moral decisions? And every ethical act must be based upon fact. If science teaches us that our facts are contingent, the driver is that we must use those that are most current so as to remain ahead of, in fact, the crest of this wave of contingency. How? Reflection, insight, and moral consideration must be the stepping stone for any or all future acts of both inquiry as well as invention of what technologies we're going to develop and use and intervention, how and why we shall use those. I thank you for your time. Think good thoughts. Thank you.